Fox 29 News in HD. Brought to you by Xfinity. The future of awesome. Tonight on Fox 29 News at 6. All I heard was two big booms and the whole roof just came in. Horror on the highway. The phone rang, my husband answered the phone and she was screaming in the phone, crying. Families jolted into a nightmare after a bus crashes, injuring dozens of local teens on a college tour. A ride home from Boston turns into a night of terror, twisted metal and broken glass as a charter bus slams into an overpass. Good evening, everybody. I'm Joyce Evans. It was supposed to be a nice trip to one of America's top universities, but it ended up sending dozens of teenagers from a local charity to the hospital. We have Fox 29 team coverage for you tonight. Omari Fleming is live in Bristol, Bucks County, Pennsylvania. He has reaction from the parents and the charity group. But we begin tonight with Chris O'Connell. He's live in Boston. Chris, you spoke with teens who were on that bus. Yeah, Joyce, several people still remain at three Boston area hospitals tonight. One of them, a sophomore at Neshaminy High School, is in critical condition at this hour. Meanwhile, teenagers and parents who had to scurry up from Philadelphia to Boston are reuniting tonight after that terrifying crash. And all I heard was two big booms and the whole roof just came in. 16-year-old Jordan Smith describing the chaos after the tour bus he was riding in slammed into a Boston overpass Saturday night. Smith, a student at Boyd's Latin High School in Philadelphia, was traveling with 38 other teens and chaperones, including his mother, who was in surgery for a head injury. And I was helping people get out and my mom was beating really bad. It was just catastrophic. The group with the Bristol-based Destin for a Dream Foundation were on a one-day college prep trip to Harvard University when the bus crashed. Investigators say the overpass, which is clearly marked, was only 10 feet. The height of the bus, more than 12 feet. It's, a, it's an underpass at Weston Ave uh, that is marked uh, with the height. Uh, and the bus uh, exceeded the height uh, that was uh, posted uh, for it in the uh, top of the bus struck the uh, overpass. Massachusetts State Police say the driver of the West Philadelphia-based Cavalry Coach is 66-year-old Samuel J. Jackson of Philadelphia, who was uninjured in the crash. He not only drove on a road he shouldn't have, students say he was distracted behind the wheel by his GPS. I mean, he was looking, he had his GPS and then he was asking people, you know, could you pull out your phones? Could you tell me uh, where, how do you get to Harvard? The day had frantic parents taking the six hour drive to their loved ones in Boston. All we could do is just pray that uh, everybody was okay. Uh, be thankful that nobody got killed and just uh, make it up here as quickly as possible. I'm sure all the parents were thinking the same thing. They wanted to get up here as quickly as possible. So now, we did a little digging on that bus company from West Philadelphia. Cavalry Coach does have a history of violations, two, in fact, in the last two years for the Department of Transportation. However, none of those violations involve crashes. We'll have much more on that investigation and talk to more students involved in that crash coming up tonight at 10 o'clock. Live in Boston tonight, Chris O'Connell, Fox 29 News. Thank you, Chris O'Connell. Very good job out there in Boston for us tonight. Now, one of the victims critically hurt in that crash is from Our Lady of Grace Parish in Bucks County. Hospital officials say he is 16-year-old Matthew Cruz. Now, according to reports, he is a student at Neshaminy High School in Langhorne. He was on that bus leaving Boston and heading back to the offices of Destin for Dream in Bristol. Fox 29's Omari Fleming is there live tonight with reaction from a mother who got that terrible phone call. Omari. Yeah, she was panicked, Joyce. You know, that bus departed destined for a dream right here behind me at about 6.30 yesterday morning. Little did the dozens of high schoolers on board that bus know that their quest to live out their college dream would turn into a disaster. She was screaming in the phone, crying. The, the, the roof's caving in on the bus. Teresa Merrigan reliving the frantic Saturday night call from her daughter, Alana. The panicked teen yelled through the phone, telling her mom this charter bus she was on wrecked. I kept trying to calm her down and I'm like, Lana, are you bleeding? And she's like, no, I can't see out the windows and, you know, I, I'm not bleeding. I, my head, I hit my head and and she's, you know, she, of course freaking out. You hear the other people in the background crying and yelling. Teresa's concern mounted when amidst the chaos of screams and mangled metal, 
her daughter's cell phone died. Alana borrowed a friend's to tell her mom what was going on. The Levittown teen, one of 35 injured and taken to the hospital. They're going to do a CAT scan also because she's having head pain. 42 students and chaperones were on board the bus that slammed into a 10-foot overpass, leaving Boston, Massachusetts for Bristol, Pennsylvania. The group was on a day trip visiting Harvard. It was part of a tour sponsored by the college prep organization Destined for a Dream, headquartered in Bristol. Parents with loved ones, you know, hug them and kiss them and let them know that, you know, that you love them because you just never know when situations like this arrive. You send your kid off, you think they're going to be safe. I mean, nowadays it's just you don't want to let them out the door. And Alana's father went up to Boston to be with his daughter. I got a chance to talk to the people here at Destined for a Dream. They say they're trying to organize things to bring some of those children back from Boston tomorrow. Reporting live in Bristol, Omari Fleming, Fox 29 News. And thank you for that report, Omari. Now, the nonprofit those kids are part of is has been serving kids in Bucks County for about five years. Destined for a Dream was founded in 2008. According to its mission statement, the organization works to empower young people through life coaching. Well wishes have been pouring onto their Facebook page ever since the news broke of that crash. And you can share your thoughts on this story on our website, myfoxphilly.com. Just click on the Facebook icon. You can also see more reports and video from that terrifying crash. And we are following breaking news out of Wilmington, Delaware tonight. A police officer was shot around four this afternoon on the 1200 block of Apple Street. He was taken to Christiana Hospital. Now police are not releasing his condition at this time, nor are they talking about the events leading up to the shooting? We have a crew on the scene and we will be bringing you details as soon as they come in. A car hit a pedestrian walking along a road in Burlington, New Jersey. This happened overnight here at Sykesville and North Hanover Roads. No word tonight on the condition of the victim. The driver of the car did stop and police say that they will not be filing any charges. On to our weather now. Mother Nature brought another coating of snow to our area. Not as bad as I thought it was going to be. This is what it looked like early this morning in Bucks County. Snow covered all the parked cars there along the streets. But you can see the streets were being treated. PennDOT crews out there busy salting the roads all night long. And this is what it looked like today in Camden County. The snow and cold temperatures did not stop these people from running at Cooper River Park. So. When will we see a bit of a warm up from all this winter weather? Let's get on over to meteorologist Caitlin Roth, who's here with an early look at the forecast. Hey, Caitlin. Hey, Joyce. It's going to be a couple of days before we lose the cold temperatures, but at least we saw a bit more sun earlier today. Now, snow showers continue coming off the lakes as the cold air pours into the area. They've made it about as far east as central Pennsylvania. They usually hit the mountains and then fade away, but we could see some flurries start to move into our northwestern counties as we go into tonight. A better look at that shows we're mainly dry around the Delaware Valley, but clouds have increased. We could see some flurries through tonight. Let's move to the maps where over the past 24 hours we saw anywhere from a half inch to about two inches across the area with last night's snow. Not much, but enough to really slick up the roads. Last night, it was pretty hard on some of the back roads. Now, New London and Chester County, they were the winners at 2.2 inches. Green Creek and Cape May County and down along southern New Jersey saw a little bit more as well. Percocy an inch, less than an inch for Wilmington and just over a half inch at Philadelphia Airport. Port. Temperatures right now, we are stuck in the deep freeze, no melting just quite yet. 33 in Philly, 29 in Pottstown, 27 in Allentown, and 29 in Trenton, 32 at the AC Airport. A bit of a breeze today, so that made it feel like it was in the 20s. It will be very cold tonight, with most of us slipping into the teens. More on this cold spell is coming up in your full forecast. Joyce? All right, thank you, Caitlin. And you can get the latest weather conditions anytime you want at our website, myfoxphilly.com. Just click on the weather tab. A U.S. Navy SEAL and best-selling author is among two people gunned down at a shooting range in Texas. Next, more on the accused shooter and what may have driven him to kill the war hero. And stocks soar. The Dow hits a milestone it hasn't seen in years. Financial expert Gene Marks is here to talk about what this means for average consumers like you and me. And shocking conditions on the South Jersey Bridge. What the owner of this bridge is doing now that Fox 29 is asking questions about. We'll be right back.
Get Fox 29 breaking news alerts anytime. Text news to 46373 or sign up on myfoxphilly.com. A surprising story tonight. An American hero here killed along with another man at a Texas gun range. Now police say they have the gunman in custody. But what caused him to snap? The guy who took out uh, one of the America's best snipers here. Fox's Molly Line has the story. The loss of Chris Kyle, known as the U.S. military's most lethal sniper to a fatal gunshot wound, has stunned the military community where he was revered for his skill and heroic service. Kyle wrote the best-selling autobiography, American Sniper, published by HarperCollins, which is owned by the same parent company as Fox News Channel. The story details his 150-plus kills of insurgents. Kyle and another man were both killed at the Rough Creek Lodge. That's roughly 50 miles west of Fort Worth, Texas, yesterday afternoon. The accused shooter is believed to be a troubled former soldier now in custody. Texas authorities say 25-year-old Eddie Ray Ruth of Lancaster is believed to have shot the victims around 3.30 in the afternoon, fleeing the lodge area in a pickup truck. A 911 call reporting the deaths didn't come in until hours later. A motive for the shootings remains unclear, but local Texas station WFFA Channel 8 is reporting the Ruth suffered from post-traumatic stress disorder. Kyle and 35-year-old Chad Littlefield had taken Ruth to the range in an effort to help him cope, and Ruth reportedly turned on the two men, shooting them in the back. At approximately 8 p.m., Ruth arrived at his residence in Lancaster and police were able to take him into custody after a brief pursuit. Kyle was a true American patriot and it appeared multiple times here on Fox News Channel where he talked about his love of country. You have to show respect. That flag is red, white, and blue and the red stands for the blood the guys have spilled. Not just the guys here in Iraq, Afghanistan, but all through our history. You're not going out purposely just trying to kill people and rack up numbers. You're going out to save Americans. Ruth faces two counts of capital murder. Chris Kyle leaves behind a wife and two kids. In New York, Molly Line, Fox News. And taking a look at some other national headlines tonight, we are now in the sixth day in that Alabama hostage situation where police say a man abducted a five-year-old boy and is holding him inside an underground bunker. Today, Jimmy Lee Dykes, the accused kidnapper, told police the boy is doing well. He has blankets, he has an electric heater to keep him warm along with some toys and coloring books. People down in Midland City believe that this situation, at least they're hoping that it will end soon. He's coming out. It may, we don't know when, and we will never know why probably this ever, we were ever faced with this as a community, as a whole. Also happening today, the bus driver who Dykes allegedly shot and killed is laid to rest. People are calling Charles Pollard Jr. here a hero after he tried to protect that bus full of children. The gun control debate rages on as President Barack Obama gets ready for a trip to Minnesota to talk about curbing gun violence. Lawmakers and experts on both sides of the debate argue their cases on the Sunday morning talk shows. Two of the biggest issues are universal background checks and a proposed ban on assault weapons and multiple round clips. Mark Kelly, the husband of former Congress woman Gabrielle Giffords who was shot <laughs> says freedom oh that's nice yeah. says freedom this is not the only issue here you know I defended the Second Amendment with, with my life over Iraq and Kuwait you know but this isn't about the Second Amendment anymore this is about public safety <laughs> But the NRA took aim at universal background checks, saying it would just keep law-abiding citizens from getting guns, since, according to Wayne LaPierre of the NRA, criminals already get their guns illegally. Is it really a true sign of a growing economy or just a number on a board? for a day. The Dow Jones, one of the biggest indicators of how Wall Street is faring, broke the 14,000 point mark on Friday, happening for the first time in more than five years. And while more jobs were created, the unemployment rate ticked up 
from 7.8 to 7.9 percent. So what does it mean to my wallet and yours? Financial expert Gene Marks is here to help us understand it all. Thanks for coming in, Gene. Hey, Joyce. Good to see you. Good to see you on a Super Bowl Sunday. Okay. So what are we average citizens to make of all this Dow Jones milestone stuff? Uh, well, first of all, um, it's a great thing, of course. Uh, the stock market is up at 14,000. That's the most it's been since before the Phillies won the World Series in 2008. So um, it's a milestone for most of us. But I have to tell you, Joyce, and I always tell this to clients as, my, as well, it doesn't necessarily mean, you know, it's a good thing for the economy, that the economy is good and going well or that it reflects the economy. I mean, what we're seeing here is, um, think about it, interest rates are so low right now. I mean, when you're putting money away in your savings account, you're getting like hardly nothing, right? So mm -hmm. a lot of people are saying, you know, if I'm not investing in interest rates, I can't get return elsewhere. Let's put it back in the market. And in my opinion, and a lot of other popular opinions are, that's what we're seeing. It's, it's, it's the money is going there because there's no really other place to go to invest your money to get a good return. So is it helping our 401ks or does it depend on whether you're invested in stocks? Right. I mean, it really does. So if you have that 401k and you're kind of broken up with some in stocks and some in interest bearing stuff, I mean, the, the, the ones that are in the stock market are doing better. But that doesn't mean that you should throw all your money into stocks, please. It really just depends on where you are in life and what your investment strategy is. And you always need to keep a good balance because you never want to put all your eggs in one basket. Well, Gene, what does it mean to businesses like yours? You know, it, it's a very, very good thing, Joyce. I mean, the, the, the growing stock market is a psychological thing. It makes us feel better. It makes us feel like we're richer. So when customers of mine look at their bank accounts or their investment accounts and see that there's money there to be had, it kind of lets them open up their wallets a little bit more and spend a little bit more money. So for business owners, even both large and small, when they're looking to hire people, make investments, they're looking at their own wealth first. And when they see the stock market going up, it really does incentivize us to say, hey, you know, things aren't going so bad. Maybe I will hire that extra person or buy that piece of equipment. It's a good thing for the economy. Well, what about the job numbers, though? A mixed bag here. The president is happy that businesses made more hires than expected, but right. the unemployment rate went up just a tap. What does that mean? Yep, it, it's a mathematical conversation, right? So what's happening is because the economy is getting a little bit better, more people are entering the job market. So when you have more people now looking for jobs and then suddenly you see who's unemployed, that means that that rate starts going up again. So um, it's a tick. Uh, it's good that we're adding jobs to the economy, but no one denies that we're just not adding enough jobs to the economy. The economy is really growing very slow. And Joyce, it was just announced last week that the economy actually contracted in the last quarter, which is really not a good sign for the future. Okay. But for now, you know, again, the stock market keeps going up because why not put your money in stocks? There's no other better place to get a return right now. All right. Let's hope for the best. Yeah. Gene Marks, thanks so much for coming in and joining us tonight. Thanks, Joyce. Take, Take care. care. All right. Kids at the Orchard Middle School or Orchard Valley Middle School in Sewell, New Jersey. We're busy this morning prepping for their Super Bowl fundraiser. They made more than 4,000 hoagies. Mm, the two-foot sandwiches sell for $10 each, and all proceeds will go to local families facing costly medical procedures. Well, getting new use out of old uniforms, a soldier is turning Army fatigues into art. We're going to tell you what drove him to make these inspirational displays. That's coming up next. Plus, video games aren't what they used to be, at least not the ones I used to play. We'll take a glimpse into the future of video games coming up a little later. Fox 29 Weather Authority, the only station that brings you updates throughout the day. Fox 29 is your weather authority. An Indiana veteran has a unique way of putting his old army fatigues to some good use. He's using uniforms to help himself and others cope with the horrors of war. Fox's walk, Walt Makaborski, has his inspirational story. Malachi Muncy joined the National Guard after 9-11. At 18, he says he wasn't prepared to see death when he was deployed to Iraq. I'd seen some of them get injured and medevac and shrapnel and, and then thinking like, ah, oh, well, that's what's going to happen to me. He says he was broken by war and he was also dealing with a broken home life. I started taking sleeping pills just to sort of like zombify, you know, to, to edge out. Then he turned to drugs and alcohol and was afraid to ask for help. My biggest concern was, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go ask for help and they're going to kick me out. Uh, I ended up in the hospital with an overdose. 
When he hit rock bottom, he started keeping a journal. It started with writing. My art started with my writing. Then his passion turned to what's called combat paper. It was sort of a meditation. It's paper made out of shredded uniforms. This is a print on paper made from combat uniforms. A canvas to share his conflicts and convictions. It speaks to my personal experiences with addiction and that trapped feeling. Soldiers tell him that's how they feel as well. This is what happens to be summer. But Andrea Healy, who was based at Camp Atterbury, says it also speaks to hope. And she's donating some of her uniforms to his new mission. So he can share the other uniforms with other veterans in his workshops and continue his service. Thank you very much. This is the one of many. And we'll come up with some great, great piece of art so that I can use as a memory. Malachi says this is his favorite piece. It's called Escape an image of what's possible even when it seems like there's no way out. I want to, to, to enable other people to share their stories and, and reclaim their stories. Walt Mack, Fox News. Very nice. Well, the safety of a local bridge is called into question following a Fox 29 investigation. Next, shocking video our cameras captured and what the owner of this bridge plans to do about it. Caitlin. Oh, it's very cold once again today. Temperatures reach only 33 here in Philadelphia. The normal high for early February, 41 degrees. To let you know if there's any moderation in the temperatures that's coming up. We are following breaking news out of Wilmington, Delaware tonight. Police say an officer was shot this afternoon around 4 o'clock. So let's get right out to Dave Kenshin for the latest details. Dave, what happened out there? Well, Joyce, this is still an active scene that's developing as we speak. Investigators from Wilmington Police and the New Castle County Police Department are working on Apple Street. They have it blocked off here in the southeastern part of Wilmington. Let me show you some video right now of the scene and the investigators at work. We know that an officer was shot while responding to some kind of an incident, some kind of a call around 4 o'clock. Police are not telling us much about the details that officer was taken to Christiana Hospital. We do not know the condition that that officer is in right now. We know investigators are on their way and others from Wilmington Police that are even working in Alabama. They were doing training, scheduling uh, training there. They're on their way up here. They'll be here tonight to work more on this investigation. All we can tell you right now is an officer was shot and there's a search for at least one person with a gun in this incident. This is something that has, again, Wilmington Police here and County Police working on this whole investigation. They're trying to talk to witnesses and trying to get some leads to find out what exactly happened here and who may have done this. That's the latest here in Wilmington. Reporting live, Dave Kinchin, Fox 29 News. Thank you so much, Dave. Now, we are following a developing story out of Boston from the top of our newscast. A bus crashes into an overpass, injuring 39 people. Now, riders are saying the driver was distracted. First brought to this story is breaking news last night at 10. Many of those injured were from Bristol Township right here in Bucks County, Pennsylvania. They were high school students touring Harvard University. The bus driver was not hurt in the crash and police have not charged him. Fox 29 investigates a South Jersey bridge may be getting much needed repairs now after Fox 29 presses for answers about its safety. Fox 29 investigative reporter Jeff Cole has more now on why a top state official will be demanding some answers. It's a brisk winter morning and we're in a small fishing boat motoring along Oldman's Creek in South Jersey. Our guides are Frank Boginski, who brought us the story, and his friend Rebecca Dowdy. We've come to this creek not to drop a line for the big channel cats Boginski pulls from these waters. We're here to take a hard look at this. Missing and crumbling concrete, metal support bars exposed to the air and salt water, and a dislodged leaning retaining wall at the base of a bridge. Not just any bridge, a railroad bridge that carries the weight of tons and tons of cargo that thunders across up to six times a day hauled by massive freight trains. Boginski, who spent his life here, says he's worried. My biggest concern is that the rail could drop a couple inches, and when it does, the train could come off the track. And there's something else you need to know. 
The Old Mids Creek Rail Bridge sits on the same line as the ill-fated Swing Bridge in Paulsboro, where a multi-car freight train derailed late last year. The mishap sent rail cars into the Mantua Creek, spewing chemicals into the air and water. Residents were forced from their homes for a week and businesses were shuttered. Bridge owner Conrail has been hit with lawsuits while the National Transportation Safety Board investigates. So you can see the same kind of disaster happening here that happened in Paulsboro behind us. Absolutely. This is something that's been on my mind ever since the Paulsboro incident. The bridge spans the creek between Oldman's and Logan Townships. And like the swing bridge in Paulsboro, Conrail owns this one too. It's at the base of this big wall where the concrete's been worn away and these steel poles known as rebar are exposed. It's easily seen when the tide is low. And there's something else. This retaining wall, apparently used to keep stones packed around the railroad ties, is pushed back, opening a gap where some of the stones have fallen away from the ties and tumbled down to the water. Here's what the retaining wall looks like on the other side of the bridge. See how this, this rebar is bending? It's we showed the video to New Jersey State Senate President Steve Sweeney, who represents the region in Trenton. What's your reaction to the video we just showed you? Well, I, I have great concern. Sweeney, an iron worker by trade, is calling for immediate action. Either they're going to have to bring in a third-party engineer that we're comfortable with, or the state of New Jersey can come and take a look at it. But no matter what, they have to fix that. That is not an acceptable structure. I know what's on those trains, and it scares you. And if the public knew what was on those trains, it would really scare you. There's the gap. We also asked Franklin Moon, an associate engineering professor at Drexel University, to view our tape. He has a doctorate in engineering and tests highway bridges for safety. The concrete was there for a reason, uh, initially, and it's probably something that, uh, you know, should be put back. Dr. Moon says, while it's difficult to say if there is a safety issue with the rail bridge right now, the longer it stays like this, the greater the chance of a problem. The more that deterioration occurs, there will come a point where it's not going to be able to resist the forces any longer, and then you could really have a safety concern. Conrail declined to view our tape or answer questions about the condition of the bridge. In a statement the company wrote, Conrail bridges are regularly inspected under a bridge inspection program developed by Conrail and approved by the Federal Railroad Administration. And this bridge is no exception. It is both regularly inspected under and fully compliant with our FRA approved program. But now there's new information. Aware that our story was about to air, the Federal Railroad Administration sent an inspector to check out the bridge on Sunday. The FRA now says the bridge is in safe operating condition, is fully compliant with federal regulations, and being properly managed by Conrail. The FRA would not answer questions about that weekend inspection. The stones are all moving down that way. Frank Baginski says he still wants the bridge patched up so that Oldman's Creek remains just how he's always remembered. Now it was time to definitely sound the alarm and say, hey, let's get this bridge fixed. We love it here. Fox 29's Jeff Cole reporting for us tonight. Now, Senator Sweeney tells us Conrail says they will be making the repairs if he sends them a letter. Now, again, Conrail and the Fed say that the bridge is safe. Sweeney wants it to return to its original design. Okay, well, Valentine's Day is just around the corner, and one special guest is turning heads. Oh, we're going to tell you how much you'll have to shell out for this teddy bear. You won't believe it. That's next. And an unlikely pairing in California. What a brewery is doing to help a monastery there. It's all coming up next. He is known as the French Spider-Man, and he's living up to his name again. Daredevil Alan Robert is getting set to scale this 27-story hotel in Cuba tomorrow. The 50-year-old climber is known for his dangerous stunts, and he never uses a safety line. Good luck to him. Prayers have been answered at a Northern California monastery. These monks are teaming up with 
a brewery to raise money to restore their Gothic chapter house. Now, these stones were transported from Spain, where they were used to build another monastery back in the 12th century. So how does beer come into play here? Well, these monks have been making beer and wine for centuries, and they are bottling it up, that experience, to help restore this piece of history. That's really, um, you know, sort of a brewer's dream come true to be able to, to work with the, with the monks in this way. Yeah, mellow monks. Well, so far, the collaboration has raised $140,000, and the monks say they would like to get up to $2 million to see this beautiful monastery back to its original glory. Well, if those monks want to raise some money, maybe they should get their hands on one of these. The Vermont Teddy Bear Company is ready for Valentine's Day, selling these cute and cuddly bears complete with a six-carat diamond ring. Fellas, looking for a gift for that special lady? Oh, all it's going to cost you is a cool $33,000. Wonder how much the bear costs. All right, well, video games are no longer played by kids using joysticks. Next, we're gonna take you behind the scenes to give you a peek into the future of gaming, and it may surprise you to learn how many adults are getting in on the action. Caitlin. The choice winter has made its return across the area. Over the past few days, we saw a couple rounds of snow, including last night. We've got another one on the way, and as we go to break, we'll take a peek at Ultimate Doppler, showing some snow showers across central Pennsylvania. I'll let you know if that reaches us, and we'll have your full forecast coming up. A hundred eighty-three million Americans play video games, and believe it or not, 25% of them are over 50 years old. The games are more realistic than ever, and now one company is taking them one step further. Fox's Jeremy Campbell shows us a new league of superheroes. Welcome to Arnix Entertainment. Please allow me to escort you to the secret on the ground lab. This is all access into a hidden laboratory, a real life company creating virtual worlds for 150 million gamers. At Arctic Entertainment, the employees dress like characters because they play them too. You might recognize this guy as Adam Bone. CEO of a company he started in his garage. We had wild dreams like everybody does. We never thought it was actually going to happen. Inside his kingdom, you'll see an army of artists. Creating video game stuff is really fun. Sketching ideas, animating, colorizing, pixelating. Then you give it to the coder and they go, oh God, why? And then it goes in the game. Sounds like the coder has the hardest job. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> Video games have come a long way since Super Mario Brothers. The Arctic team has spawned six games. The most popular is called Adventure Quest World. It's one of the world's largest multiplayer games with 16,000 playing together in real time at any time. Then there's merchandise, shirts, action figures, posters for sale in places like Toys R Us. The heart of it all is the game. And you won't find a single copy in stores. Well, the traditional model was you'd buy a box or you'd download or you'd get a, a CD. Not here. The company doesn't manufacture game cartridges, discs, or DVDs. Back in the day, people used to go to the store and buy a box. But uh, all of our games play straight in your web browser. That means there's no downloads, nothing to install. Like vinyl records to MP3s, this trend shapes the future of gaming. Well, I think we're seeing it now. Ardix Entertainment's next chapter brings 3D to your laptop. No need for a game system, just a home computer. Our, our new game, uh, Adventure Quest 3D Legend of Lore, is going to be a console quality game, 3D, that you play in your web browser. All free. So how do they pay the designers, the coders, the artists? What about paying the knights? <laughs> Easy. Get gamers so hooked, they pay for perks. If you want to go past a certain point or get the best stuff or save time doing very repet uh, repetitious tasks, uh, you have to uh, pay. Oh, and if their games never end, 
neither do the profits. Every week, our new release comes out. You can hop on, play it, and then come back next week for the whole new adventure. Jeremy Campbell, Fox News. Hey, cool stuff. Now, mm -hmm. they got nothing, though, on your super high-tech oh, yeah. weather gear out there. All we use to try to come up with snowfall uh -huh. for uh -huh. <laughs> amounts, you'd think they'd be perfect by now, but no. You got Ms. Pac-Man on there? No, I don't, no. but okay. probably need it. Maybe it yeah. could help. <laughs> hey, our amounts actually did work out, Joyce, from last night. We knew it wouldn't be too much, and as we take a live view of Old City right now, here at 4th and Market by our Fox 29 studios, not much snow on the ground. What came through last night didn't really stick too well here in the city, but all across the area you saw about an inch or two and that does include portions of South Jersey and Delaware with that weak little system that came by last night but it was so cold it was enough to quickly coat the roads. Let's move to ultimate Doppler. We've still got some snow showers showing up. This is all lake effect so coming off of Lake Erie as well as into upstate New York. That's where you get some of the heavier snow showers as the cold air really pours into across the region. Central PA seeing some of those light snow showers move across the area. They usually make it about far east as Williamsport State College, Harrisburg, and start to fall apart. But I do think some of these snow showers will start to track into our area, specifically north and west. We'll see if they hold together as they cross the Philadelphia area. Now moving over towards our maps, it was a very cold day. Yesterday we only hit 30, not too much improvement this afternoon. 33 degrees and the normal is 41. The record high not too long ago, 62 degrees in 2006. Now right now, temperatures beginning their decline. It's 30 in Philly, 27 in Pottstown, 24 in Allentown, 31 in Wilmington, 27 in Millville. Winds are fairly light, only in that 5 to 10 mile an hour range, if that, but it doesn't matter. It doesn't take too much of a breeze until you have to start factoring in the wind chill and it feels like it's in the 20s to even the teens up in the high elevations of the Poconos. Fox Futurecast starting at at 6 o'clock, you can see some of those snow showers trying to make it into our area. It looks like they'll split the Philadelphia area. A little bit of light snow down across northern Delaware and then into Salem and Cumberland County in New Jersey and a little bit in the Lehigh Valley. Shouldn't add up to anything, just passing flurries through the overnight. We clear out late. The wind increases too. It'll be a cold but a sunny start to Monday. Sun gives way to more cloud cover in the afternoon and by evening we're watching our next week's system move by. Again, it's just going to clip the southern area. That's where we've seen most of the snow over the past two days. The first round was early Friday morning. That brought some significant snow to parts of the Jersey Shore, and the second one was last night. But as you go through the overnight Monday and early Tuesday, we can see a little bit of snow accumulating before that moves out in time for the AM rush. Really only talking about an inch or two generally anywhere south and east of 95 in Delaware and South Jersey. The rest of us north of the Turnpike looks like we stay mainly dry here in the Philadelphia area, just a few flurries. Cold with some flurries tonight, very cold actually. We fall back into the teens in the Burbs, 21 here in the city, becoming breezy late and it will be pretty windy as we go through Monday. Cold too, 32 degrees with sun giving way to some more cloud cover. We'll give it a four. It could be worse, but it could be a lot better. And we'll see some better weather as we go through the seven-day forecast. 37 there on Tuesday as some uh, morning snow gives way to clouds. There could be a few more flurries early Wednesday, but temperatures slowly moderate in the seven-day forecast. We're back into the upper 40s by Friday, warm enough to bring us a rain shower, not a snow shower. And next weekend does look nice, taking the edge off that real, real cold air. Wow. Yeah. Never thought I'd long for rain. For, or for 40s. Oh, thank good, you, Caitlin. All right. Howard Eskin standing by in sports. Hey, Howard. Well, I don't want rain or snow. How's that? All right. Some really crazy stuff that you will never see in a golf tournament. And Villanova needs some wins if they hope, have any hopes of getting an NCAA invite. Today, a big game coming up in sports. If Villanova has any chance of making the NCAA tournament, they need more wins than those big ones against Syracuse and Louisville. You need to beat the teams that are considered winnable. All right, today was one of them against Providence. Let's go to Villanova. Jay Wright knows he needs a big win in this game at Villanova, uh, but he was trailing most of the game. Right here, Bryce Cotton for Providence. Hits the three. Providence was up by six at the half. Villanova mounts a comeback in the second half. Javon Pinston with the ball, goes to the basket, cuts the lead to two, 52 to 50. All right, with the score tied, it will be late in the game. Providence looking for the last shot. Bryce Cotton again with the three with two seconds left. Villanova has a chance, but it's a prayer at the end of the game. It's a half-court heave. 
Providence beats Villanova 55-52 as the shot bank banks off the rim. All right, when you are on a roll in golf, sometimes you just stay in that zone. This week, Phil Mickelson went back home and started with a 60 in the first round. He remained amazing in the waste management Phoenix Open. Let's go to Phoenix and take a look. Phil day. Mickelson look on a roll. Watch this putt. It's like miniature golf. Play, hit the windmill, hit the bank, roll it in. That's, that's like playing miniature golf. 56 feet. He bogeyed the second hole, and then it was on a roll afterwards. Here is 17. He was, for the birdie here, he was 28 under par, which ties a PGA record only, I say only, four under par today. All right, last night, some surprises with the NFL AP Awards at the Super Bowl. But I think the voters got it right. Minnesota running back Adrian Peterson. Peterson won the most valuable player of the NFL. Not a surprise to me. Peterson rushed for 2,097 yards this season. Eight yards short of the all-time record. But what's more amazing, he did it less than a year after ACL surgery. He also led the Vikings to the playoffs. And then the feel-good award of the week was the coach of the year. Honors went to the new Arizona head coach, Bruce Arians. Arians was the head coach of the Indianapolis Colts for 12 games this year. He was the interim head coach while Chuck Pagano was getting chemo treatments. Many remember Arians, who was a head coach at Temple. The other major awards, the NFL awards, yesterday Peyton Manning, the Comeback Player of the Year award, no surprise, an easy one after neck surgery. Robert Griffin III was the Offensive Rookie of the Year, and Houston defensive lineman J.J. Watt was a Defensive Player of the Year. All right, things you never see at a golf tournament, and the Phoenix Open is a crazy tournament. The caddy races, the ca caddies racing to the green, some caddies don't make it. All right, this is a fun, they party all night, they have a good time all day, and it is amazing when you see those things. Patty Harrington with the field goal on 16. Remember, they're playing golf, and some of the players are just amazing, but they have fun at the Phoenix Open. Oh, no, 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 yes. no. You never see that in a golf tournament. Never, 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 never. That was pretty good but stuff. But that's what the Phoenix Open is. And I think those caddies had a little bit too much to drink. Yeah, <laughs> uh, they're probably All they're right. doing it, too. Well, that is going to do it for us tonight. Be sure to join us on Fox 29 News at 10. We'll see you later. Oh, football on everybody's mind tonight. Uh, would you let your kids play it? President Obama says maybe not because of safety concerns. We're going to show you both sides of that debate. And now we're going to say good night <laughs> to you until 10 o'clock tonight. Good night, everybody. Bob's Burgers is next. Okay, so what?